Good morning. And a very warm welcome to Blackburn and Seafield Church, especially with all the, the things that are going on in the world today. It's nice to be able to get together, even if we have to be two metres apart. A warm welcome to all those who are watching our service on YouTube as well. I do hope that you are enjoying being back in church, even with the awkward seating arrangements, which is all done to keep each and every one of us safe. We are thinking about changing the time from uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 12 o'clock, so there would be a service at 11 and a service at 12. We have consulted the elders, um, and some of you spoke to me last week, and that seemed to be the, the, the majority. We're just making sure that everything is okay and, and trying to get the best time to change over. So that is going to be, hopefully on the, the service that's starting in September, there will be an 11 o'clock service and a 12 o'clock service. And again, staying in the A to L and the M to Z. One lady that I spoke to um, was a bit unhappy because she couldn't read her Bible because there are no Bibles in the pews. But what I said is you can actually bring your own Bible. We can't give you a Bible, but if you wanted to bring your own Bible, then you can bring your own Bible. Just don't bring your Henry, because that would encourage you to sing, and we're not allowed to do that. But if you wanted to bring your own Bible to read the scripture passage along with whoever's doing reading, then you can do that. Also this week I've actually put the scripture reading that's going to be up on the screen as well. And I hope that as we worship today, that we will experience something of the Lord's presence and his peace. You will notice that Sean, our organist, is not here today. He um, has been unwell, um, so he's, just, he, he's not coming because that's to keep everybody safe. We who are members of the one body join together to praise God. We who are blessed with the gift of grace join together to tell of God's glory. We who are part of the family of God join together to affirm Jesus Christ as Lord. Let us worship God together. We remain seated to listen and reflect upon Hymn 640. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. And if you know the words, please sing them in your head. Though our walls may crumble, we remember that we, your church, 
are built on a solid foundation of rock. And through your love, we will never fall. We gather surrounded by your Holy Spirit, drawn close to you and to each other in praise and thanksgiving, spurred into action by your life-giving presence, encouraged to love our neighbours as ourselves and to speak your holy word to the world. We gather as one body of broken bones, seeking to do your work, praying for forgiveness when we fail to do what we can to live as you have told us, asking for support when we falter from the path of love for everyone. And in this moment of silence, we bring to you all the ways that we have let you down. Lord, forgive us. We ask for boldness to live in your example, to avoid the trappings of this world, to give ourselves wholly to your mission, and to work tirelessly to praise you and love your people. Of our loving God, we come before you in awe at your majesty, in wonder at your works, praising your holy name today and every day. And hear us as we say together, the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And invite Alan Baker to read our scripture lesson for the same. Morning. The reading this morning is Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. Then Jesus came to the region of Syria, Philippi. He asked his disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, You are Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, <clears throat> Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not very revealed by, this, by man, but by the Father in heaven. I tell you, that Peter, <coughs> sorry, and on the rock of this, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of heaven. Whenever you, you bind earth, it will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was Christ. Amen. May the Lord have his blessings and his holy words. Thank you. Let's pray. Almighty God, you have taught us that your word is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Help us to listen for your word and take it into our hearts so that we may come to know you more fully, love you more truly, and follow more faithfully in the steps of your Son, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forevermore. Amen. In today's Gospel, we have an early example of an opinion poll, and it was Jesus himself who conducted it. Even although it was a very limited one, 
It concerned a central issue, the identity of Jesus. Today we have lots of polls, and one thing polls show us is the variety and often contradictory views people have about any particular issue or individual. The poll in the Gospel bears this out. We see the people come up with a variety of answers to the crucial question as to who Jesus is. Jesus and his disciples ventured into the district of Caesarea Philippi, an area about 25 miles northeast of the Sea of Galilee. The region had tremendous religious implications. The place was littered with temples of the Syrian gods, an elaborate marble tam a temple that had been erected by Herod the Great, father of the then ruling Herod Antipas. There was also the influence of Greek gods and worship of Caesar as God himself. You might say that the world religions were on display in this time. It was with this scene in the background that Jesus chose to ask the most crucial question of his ministry. He looked at his disciples in a moment of reflection and said, Who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples being sharing with Jesus what they had heard from the people who had seen following Jesus. Some say that you are Elijah, others say John the Baptist, some others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It's always been this way. Jesus, as seen by the masses, is seen in so many different ways. You can speak of Jesus as a prophet, a holy man, a teacher, or spiritual leader, and few will object. But speak of God as the speak of, of Jesus as the Son of God, divine, of the same nature as the Father, and people will line up to express their disapproval. A billion Muslims will say, Prophet yes, God no. Jews scattered around the world will say, Teacher yes, Messiah no. Many others may say, Exemplary man, yes, divine no. Who do people say he is? Who do you say he is? And what are we called to do? Let's take a look at the answers to these three questions. When Jesus asked the first of these three questions, he did so in his first and only trip outside Palestine. It was a critical moment in Jesus' life. He was coming to the end of his ministry and he wanted to be alone with his disciples, far from the watchful eyes of the Pharisees, Sadducees and other religious authorities and assess the last few years of his ministry. Do they now understand who he was? Were all his efforts fruitful, or had it been in vain? It was a critical moment, and critical moments call for critical questions. Who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples responded, some say that you're Elijah. Now why would people think that Jesus was the long-deceased prophet Elijah? Elijah was of course a highly revered personality in the religious life of the Hebrews. His defeat of the 450 prophets of Baal on the top of Mount Carmel was a story well known by even, even by children. To show you the great importance of Elijah, we must remember that when Jesus was transfigured, Two men from the past came back from the grave to speak to him, Moses and Elijah. But there was yet another reason why people thought that Jesus was Elijah. It was a commonly held belief among the Hebrews that one day Elijah would return and that would mark the end of the world. In the very last passage in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, contains these words. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Clearly, Elijah's coming would mark the most important day in the history of the world. And Jesus understood this. I believe that is why in Matthew 11, 
Jesus said to the crowds, If you are willing to accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah, who is to come? In that one statement, Jesus proclaimed that he was the Messiah, and the end had now come, but he knew not many would be able to accept it. Elijah was supposed to come back before the end of time, so the disciples have heard the people talking about Jesus as if he was Elijah. But others said that Jesus was John the Baptist who had come back to life. You remember that John the Baptist's career was cut short when he confronted Herod and passed. Herod had John beheaded. But the death soon turned into a martyrdom and John's popularity among the people flourished. John the Baptist was the first prophet to come on the scene in over 400 years. His austere lifestyle closely patterned that of Elijah before him. While the upper classes and the religious establishment rejected his message, he received wild acceptance among the masses and many were baptised under his ministry. By saying that, John, that Jesus was John the Baptist reincarnated, the people were saying of Jesus that he was a great and powerful prophet in the line of Elijah. The disciples added one more description. Some were saying that you're Jeremiah. Now why Jeremiah? To understand this, you have to know a little story. It was commonly believed by the Jews that before their ancestors were hauled off into captivity in Babylonia and the Ark of the Covenant destroyed, that Jeremiah had secretly gone into the Ark and removed the altar of incense and hidden it in a remote cave on Mount Nebo. Just before the Messiah was supposed to return, so the story went, Jeremiah would return and produce this altar to the glory of God. Was the story true? Probably not. But the important thing was that the, the people believed that it was true. All of these descriptions tell us one thing. The people thought Jesus was a great prophet. They thought Jesus was here to herald the coming of the Messiah. These were compliments of the highest order. Jesus had asked, who do people say that I am? It was an important question, but not the crucial question, and it's to this question we turn now. Jesus turns to his disciples, and he asks his most personal friends, his inner circle, his trusted students, the critical question, what about you? He asked them. Who do you say that I am? The question is not a trick one or a trivial one. It's a very serious question. It's a question that resounds through the entire gospel. It's the main question of the gospel. It concerns the identity of Jesus. Everything hinges on this. He didn't pluck this question out of the air. It was a question that obviously was on the lips of everyone. Who is this man, Jesus? By answering Elijah, John the Baptist and Jeremiah, the people paid Jesus compliments of the highest order. They were exalting the man, Jesus, but it was the wrong answer. And so Jesus asked their personal opinion, but who do you say that I am? In other words, you've told me what other people think. But I want to know what you think. Who do you say that I am? No doubt Jesus already knew what they thought. So he gave them the opportunity to express themselves. We can only marvel at how Jesus said nothing to Simon, but waiting for the Father to speak to him first. I would suggest to you this morning that that is the most urgent, the most relevant, the most theological question that confronts us today. Whether we turn in life, wherever we turn in life, we are faced with the implications of this question. The Gospel writers also tempted in their own fashion to answer this most fundamental question. They bestowed upon him numerous titles and claims. Son of David, Son of Man, Son of God, Divine Physician, King, Prophet, Bridegroom, Light of the World, the Door, the Vine, High Priest, 
the firstborn of creation, the bright and morning star, the Alpha and the Omega. All of these were attempts to answer that question posed by Jesus. But these are attempts made by others. Jesus is more concerned what your answer is than what their answer is. Martin Luther, the German theologian, wrote, I care not whether he be Christ, but that he be Christ for you. Peter responded, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus at this point gave him a new name. You're no longer Cephas, he said, you are Petros, the rock. In truth, nothing was ever to be the same for Peter again. comes in. Who do we say Jesus is today? And what do we do about it? What then is the church to do with this information? Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. He hands him the authority to conduct the business of God. He tells Peter, whatever you decide to do, it will be done in heaven. And whatever you decide shouldn't be done, it will be bound in heaven. Peter, go out into this world and make things happen in my church. Point to sin and wrongdoing and call it to account. It's important for us to come up with our own answers, to be able to state our own beliefs and values as Christians. It's no longer enough to repeat the official answers. We have to make the faith our own. A second-hand faith is a poor faith. In the past, everything about faith was dictated to us. We weren't only given the answers, but the questions too. No one ever asked us, what do you think? We weren't even given a chance to discuss, never mind question anything. As a result, we might have to be able to get, we might have been able to give the right answers. But if we were pressed as to why we believe a particular truth or what it meant to us, we were often at a loss. Today, there may be a danger of going too far in the other direction. To hear some people speak, you would think that there was no objective truths or values. It's what I think, what I feel, and what I want that matters. But our own view can be wrong. Jesus praised Peter, not because he had his own answer, but because he had the right answer. However, we'll see that Peter didn't fully understand what he had said. While he recognised Jesus as the Messiah, he didn't know that Jesus would be a suffering Messiah. That was something he had yet to learn, and learn the hard way. We must grow in our understanding of our faith. We need to read our Bibles, consult daily reading notes, pray to Jesus, speak with others, come along to the Bible study when we start again to grow and learn. We need to speak to and witness to our faith, not just for one hour on a Sunday morning, but every moment of every day. 
The important thing is to believe out of personal conviction, a personal relationship with Jesus. The more of these people we have in the church, the more it is founded on the road. There are great things to do for the kingdom of God once we have come to that point. We too can echo Peter's words. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Your life will never be the same. Ask the woman at the well. Ask Mary Magdalene. Ask Paul. Ask Martin Luther. Ask John Wesley. Ask Mother Teresa. Ask people in this church. The crucial question for each of us is, who is Jesus for me? Is he the son of the living God for me? And if so, how does this belief affect the way I live today? Amen. Let's dedicate our offerings and come before God in prayer. Let us pray. As you have bound us to your life-giving self, we come today in praise to declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, our Saviour. We offer these tokens of money, time and talent as a sign of our continued commitment to your church, its mission and its work, that it might continue to be built through us as a solid foundation bearing witness to you, sharing your love throughout the world. God of the sea, land, air and space, we pray for your continuing blessing on our troubled planet. Just as Peter saw Jesus for who he is, we can see your world for what it is, your glorious creation, the gift of life through knowing you. We ask for the boldness to do everything we possibly can to renew and rebuild our planet, to protect it for all who come after us. As one body in Christ, the eternal community of your church, we pray for guidance and support as we continue to bear witness to you in a world where indifference far outweighs passion. We ask for ingenuity, confidence and hopefulness in order to bring your message to our communities and our world. Living God, we pray for ourselves, for this community here in Blackburn and Seafield of your beloved children, that we may continue to be the lampstand that allows your light to shine into the world, that we will use all the gifts you have given us to proclaim your message of love, to live the way you have told us and never shy away from the difficulties that come with being a Christian in a time of individualism, fear and persecution. Help this community of the faithful to remain true to your teaching and bring the light of Christ to each person we meet. As our summer comes to an end, we pray for all your children, young and old, for those returning to school after the longest break, for those without work, for those with too much, for those who make sure we have food on our tables, and for those who labour tirelessly to keep us safe and healthy, for those in hospital or waiting for an operation, for those who will operate, nurse and bring healing, we ask for your love and support, that whatever this new season will bring, they will find peace and security in you. And in this moment of silence, we bring you our own prayers. surround them and us with your loving arms and grant us your healing and wholeness. God of all, we pray for your blessing on all that we are and all that we do, that we will help build your kingdom today and every day. 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is hymn 631. Tell in my soul the greatness of the Lord. into the world, eager to tell others who Jesus is, eager to witness to him through all you say and do, empowered by the Holy Spirit and the amazing grace of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, the unconditional love of God our Heavenly Father, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all today, tomorrow and forever. Amen.